because US with its hard and soft power can play a significant role in creating a more peaceful world and in sharing the bounties <coughs> in sharing the universal values in sharing all that has made it exceptional ladies and gentlemen it is my privilege to be addressing this particular university a most dynamic house of learning mm -hmm. though i must admit that i thought long and hard about how best to put forth mm -hmm. the subject that brings me here the rule of law and international peace is particularly relevant for such a setting because universities are a principal player in a global system increasingly di driven by knowledge information and ideas universities are catalysts of change and progress victories are gained peace is preserved prog progress is achieved and civilization is built up not in the battlefields where ghastly murders are committed in the name of patriotism not in the parliaments where in insipid speeches are spun out in the name of debate but in educational institutions which are the seed beds of culture where boys and girls in whose hands quiver the destinies of future are trained from them will emerge when they come of age statesmen visionaries leaders and citizens committed to the nation and to the world at large it is such leaders of thought and action on whom i pin my hopes for a world without war you young students are the future and by being so the preceding generations place a sacred trust in your hands since the dawn of history humans have longed for peace but gone to war for a variety of reasons more often than not for land gold or religion a sustained peace still remains elusive but what is peace you may ask a couple of years ago i was invited to michigan to speak on imperatives of peace in the new world order while talking of peace i said when i talk of peace i mean a state of existence which makes the life on earth worthy of human beings a quality of life where people can grow and prosper where people can live in peace and pursue a life free of hunger want and disease where children can pursue their studies without the crippling effect of fear violence war malnutrition and an insecure future unquote this is my vision of peace during the last couple of decades as you are aware the pace of human progress has surpassed all stages in human history global trade and economy have expanded and lifted millions out of poverty advances in science and technology and medicine have been phenomenal despite the phenomenal progress made naked pursuit of power continues to be the main driving force 
in the politics among nations. This has led to a number of issues which are potential threats to world peace. Some of those are the Palestinian crisis, the Syrian crisis, the crisis in Afghanistan, the collapse of Central African Republic causing displacement of 400,000 persons, the Iran, US and North Korea, US tensions, disputes in East China Sea, where China has refused to abide by the uh, judgment of the International Court of Justice. Issues related to cross-border migration, the Kashmir issue, which has led to three wars between India and Pakistan, both of which are nuclear wars. The impunity of ethnic cleansing of Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar, the unprecedented urbanization in the last decade, which too is a challenge to global security, and last but not the least, terrorism. The global in inequality and poverty have been further confounded. According to an estimate, almost half people live in less than $2 a day. A billion people live on less than a dollar a day. A woman dies every minute in childbirth. Against this global inequality, in the face of this global inequality, look at the amount of money being spent on arms and equipment. According to James' defense budget report, US spent 622 billion in 2016 and ranked as number one. Second came China with a spending of dollars 191 billion third came uk with a with an amount of 53 billion and the same report predicts that by 2020 the spending total spending of countries would come to dollars 233 billion these trillions of dollars, ladies and gentlemen, could have been diverted to alleviating the human suffering and poverty. But for the absence of the rule of law in the world around us. Although the UN has an impressive record in socio-economic domain, but on, but on political issues it has a long way to go. The Security Council attempts to prevent conflicts and wars, pass strongly worded resolutions, but mostly those are not heeded. Permanent solutions remain beyond reach. Sadly, the issues are allowed to fester at the altar of power politics. But has such balance of power brought a state of peace around the world? One may ask, hasn't this power politics and the absence of rule of law rendered UN rather toothless in, re in resolving political issues? Can territorial disputes be amicably resolved merely by power? Can this approach settle the issues of conflicting mindset and divergent worldviews which go in the making of a terrorist? Can UN be vested with power to make law against war and have it enforced through paramilitary force on the pattern of domestic enforcement of law? These are the questions which crop up in one's mind when you talk of international peace and the rule of law. Historically, the evolution of the rules and discipline of international law has emerged through great wars. Modern international law first took shape in 1625 during the Thirty Years' War when Hugo Grisius, a French Dutch diplomat, produced his monumental book titled On the Law of War and Peace, 
he feared that with numerous states being released from the authority of the Pope and Emperor, there would be little restraint among them and lawlessness would prevail. He believed, and I quote, where judicial settlement ends, war begins, unquote. This concept was further developed during the Second World War by a renowned academic, Professor Hales Kensel, who propounded his famous theory of international peace through law and said, the idea of law, in spite of everything, seemed still to be stronger than any ideology of power." Unquote. The horrors of Second World War persuaded countries to assemble, which led to the establishment of United Nations, which led to the creation of Security Council, which led to the UN Charter and US can take credit for playing the pivotal role and housing these, this important institution. The rule of law in international relations means compliance by states of their obligations in international law. Although there is no international legislature to enact laws or make rules, the nations mostly comply with international law because they, rule, they, they make the rules to suit themselves. Most both of all reasons for compliance by states with international law is sheer necessity of being they're doing so. The point was well made by Professor Douglas Hurd, who said, and I quote, nation states are incompetent. None of them, not even the United States as the single remaining superpower, can adequately provide for the needs that its citizens now articulate. The extent of that inter incompetence, the extent of that incompetence has become sharply clearer during this century. The inadequacies of national governments to provide security, prosperity, or a decent environment has brought into being a huge array of international rules, conferences, institutions. The only answer to the puzzle of the immortal but incompetent nation state is effective cooperation between those states for all purposes that lie beyond the reach of any one nation." Unquote. International law is not merely a set of moral rules. The development of international law has followed the development of common law and customary law which ultimately led to the enactment of formal law. This is how the domestic law was made. Initially, it was common law, it was customary law, but then, slowly and gradually, it became the domestic law and the legislatures passed it. In the realm of international relations, treaties are honored because the states, through ratification, accord solemn commitment to comply. Indeed, in the world of globalized interdependence, the interrelationship of national and international law substantially and procedurally is such that the rule of law cannot be regarded as applicable on one plane but not on the other. There are some main practices areas where issues of international law may arise in domestic courts. What are those areas? Aviation law, commercial law, intellectual property law, 
Criminal Law, Employment and Industry Relations Law, Europe, European Treaties, Immigration, Asylum Law, Immunities and Privileges, International Organization, Law of Sea Treaties, and finally, Warfare and Weapons Law. The track record of UN in enforcing the rule of law and preventing armed conflict has been a mixed bag. In his report, Uniting Our Strength, Enhancing United Nations Support for the Rule of Law, the UN Secretary General classified the rule of law related activities of the United Nations into three baskets. The first basket is the rule of law at the international level. The second is the rule of law in the, in the context of conflict and post-conflict situations. And the third basket is the rule of law in the context of long-term development. The first bas basket corresponds to the rule of law in internationalized, while the second and the third basket match with the internalization, inter internationalization of the rule of law. As far as the first basket is concerned, the UN does not seem to have gone much further than repeating evidences such as the need to develop and respect international law and to respect, resort to international dispute resolution mechanism and to the International Court of Justice. On the contrary, the second and third basket seem to receive more concrete attention at the UN as the Secretariat is engaged in a thorough reflection on the various ways to coordinate UN actions on the field so as to promote the rule of law domestically focus on war-torn transnational re regimes through, for example, peacekeeping, peace-building activities and programs, reconciliation processes and the design of viable and effective judicial systems. The United Nations Development Program has been helpful to empower people and build nations in the post-conflict situations. Some of those countries where UNDP has established the rule of law and contributed to the development are Kyrgyzstan, Liberia, Mali, Lebanon, Ukraine, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Afghanistan, Somalia, Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, Nepal, and Yemen. Despite the modest record of UN in peacekeeping, most transactions between states governed by international law proceed smoothly and routinely on the strength of known and accepted rules. <coughs> but the regional conflicts and non-resolution of politically explosive disputes between states and the unabated arm race are not only reflective of certain deficiencies of the rule of law regime, but also a culture of impunity having multiple faces. What are those weaknesses in the international rule of law regime? You may like to ask that. The first is the temptation of some states to rewrite the rules and not comply with what they, have, they had agreed to or what the charter provides, the UN charter. The Swiss crisis in 1956 is a classic example. Then, according to a report, after the Second World War and till date, the United States has been involved in 40, 40 multi, military actions, including war in Iraq, Afghanistan, Yugoslavia, regime change in invasions, in Grenada, Panama, Haiti, military assistance with rebel groups in Angola, Elbe Salvador, Nicaragua, Goya, and missile attacks in Lebanon, Libya, Yemen, and Sudan. 
Of these, by far the most contentious was the US-led invasion of Iraq in 2003. On some of these issues, even resolutions passed by Security Council and, uh, uh, remained hostage to power politics between the major powers. The second, witness, uh, second weakness of the international rule of law regime is the, weak, is, is the, is the issue related to accountability the modern definitions of the rule of law implied that all persons must be accountable to law, that is to face social and legal consequences of their violating the law. Indeed, if the rule of law is to have any social function, the social actors must have the obligation to abide by it and society must be able to hold them accountable. From the public international point of view, the International Court of Justice is the only jurisdiction with general competence over issues of international law. However, its weakness is twofold. One, its jurisdiction is consensual, that is, only if both the disputing countries agree the International Court of Justice can assume jurisdiction. And the second weakness is that it is confined only to civil disputes and not to other disputes. These are two weak, basic weak, weak, uh, weaknesses of the International Court of Justice which has uh, made it not very effective. The third weakness in the international rule of law regime is the absence of an effective mechanism to try crimes against humanity. One mode of such trial could have been conferral of confer uh, compulsory jurisdiction on domestic courts. Now, universal jurisdiction means the jurisdiction of a, a national court to try a person accused of crime against humanity irrespective of his nationality are place of occurrence. Only 11 states including UK and Canada have conferred universal jurisdiction on the domestic courts. Uh, now, some of those crimes against humanity are genocide, torture, forcible disappearance of a person are crimes against humanity. The first court to try such offenses was established immediately after the Second World War. The United States inspired the world when it proclaimed at Nuremberg and elsewhere that aggression, genocide and other crimes against humanity are universally prohibited by law. It was recognized that states can act only through individuals and those individuals can be held accountable. And that is why the collaborators of Hitler were tried at the Nuremberg. The Nuremberg Principles were affirmed by the United Nations in 1946 and became binding legal precedents for war crime in Tokyo, tri Tokyo trials and elsewhere. Subsequently, the UN committees made a abortive attempt to, arrived, to arrive at an agreed code of crimes against humanity. Unfortunately, UN failed again because of power politics. In the last few decades, new modes of enforcement of law of crimes against humanity were devised by the United Nations. And those were, uh, besides the Nuremberg trial and the Tokyo Tribunal for Far East, 
the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia, which was established by the Security mm -hmm. Council, and then the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, and finally, the Statute of International Criminal Court adopted by affirmative vote of 120 nation states. In the contemporary age, the need for an appropriate tribunal, our court exercising universal jurisdiction, cannot be overemphasized. In the last half a century, in several African and Latin American countries, crimes against humanity have been committed with impunity. This was accompanied by mass repression and murder. These crimes remained unpunished because of the absence of an effective international system of accountability. The international rule of law regime would require the major powers to renounce their veto powers, ratify the Rome Statute, and confer compulsory jurisdiction to the International Court of Justice. Dear friends, the world we live in is so interconnected that if, if anything happens in one country, it is transmitted, transported to the other country, be it war, terrorism, poverty, recession, or environmental pollution and even diseases. We have stakes in the planet we live in, in its peace, in its progress, and we have stakes in building a social consensus for an international civil society. To be fair to US, at a certain stage of its history, it has a it has a it has played a role and attempted to create such an international civil society and a more rule-based world. The magazine Economist aptly remarked in a recent issue, and I quote, by backing global institutions that staved off dog eat dog world, the United States has made itself and the world safer and more prosperous, most prosperous, unquote. You did so because this has been part of your creed, part of your ethos, which is beautifully articulated in your Declaration of Independence, which is one of the most inspirational documents that I have read in American history. It says, and I quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, unquote. Again, you welcome people around the world to this promised land through a loud call engraved on the Statute of Liberty. Again, it's a very inspiring piece of literature. It says, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore Send these, the homeless, tempest toast to me. I left my lamp beside the golden door." Unquote. This is what made America respected around the world, and not, its, not merely its arsenal. It was respected for its openness, for its diversity, for its research and innovation, 
for its universities, for its respect for every faith, and for its respect for universal values. That golden element in American exceptionalism is under serious threat today, which strikes a discordant note. The lack of US participation in multilateral initiatives has undermined global security and progress towards social justice and environmental protection. We need to realize that populism is a blow to civic nationalism and is a negation not only of the universal values U.S. has aspired so far, but also the rule of law. For a lasting peace, however, mere reliance on UN Charter may not be enough. Why? Because peace does not rest in the charters and covenants alone. It lies in the hearts and minds of people. So let's not rest all our hopes on parchment and on paper. Let's strive to build a peace, a desire for peace, a willingness to work for peace in the hearts and minds of our, all of our people. In the ultimate end, the evolution of war, the maintenance of peace, the adjustment of international questions by peaceful means will come through the force of public opinion which controls nations. I am here in my attempt, in my modest attempt to influence the public opinion. War begins in the minds of men and it is in the minds of men that defenses to peace be constructed, so ordains the Charter of United Nations. Armed conflict, violence and terrorism would continue to cause human misery unless it ends in the minds of men. And it is in the minds of men that change has to come if we want to live in peace with others. That can only happen through quality education, real knowledge of the other, and understanding of diversity, which is the most precious, precious resource a person can have. Mercifully, the right to education has been declared a fundamental right by UNESCO. And even our constitution, the constitution of Pakistan, has declared it a fundamental right. A special curricula has to be devised which would equip the children with the knowledge to come to terms with the world, a world inhabited by people having different religions and ethnic identities. One of the fundamental aims of education should be to encourage thoughts and traits which inspire feelings of common humanity, that is, humane temper, tolerance, social justice, integrity, pursuit of truth, and a sense of history. Such an education would produce global citizens capable and competent to heal global wounds. Without promotion of such virtues, it would be difficult to achieve understanding among nations. This would help in evolving an international society which would not only be supportive of enacting a global law but also nurture and sustain it. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, socio-political revolutions take time to happen. But you don't have to wait that long. You can make a start today with the basic understanding of your role as citizens. International peace starts with local peace. 
peace in my home, peace in your home. If we want to achieve peace, we must make a difference with humans around us. You start your day with intention to spread kindness to anyone you come across, regardless of race, religion, ethnicity, gender, political affiliation, affiliation or language. And imagine what such gestures of kindness could do. As citizens in a democracy, you hold an honorous office which makes you equal irrespective of your career or vocation in life. Be it a teacher, a doctor, an engineer, an agriculturist, industrialist, a civil servant, a father, a mother, a son, or a daughter. You are a member of one race of human beings, notwithstanding your social or political affiliation. As part of that one race and living in a world of interconnectivity, you can't be indifferent to public affairs, both domestic and international. I've always believed, and history bears testimony to it, that hope has been one of the greatest living force, driving forces in human history. Let no one be discouraged by the belief that there is nothing one man or a woman can do against the enormous array of world's ills, against misery and negronims, injustice and violence. Few will have the greatness to bend history itself. But each one of us can work to change a small portion of events. And in the total of all those acts will be written the history of this generation. It is from the numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time a man or a woman stands up for an ideal, our acts to improve the lot of others, our strikes out against injustice, he or she <laughs> sends a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples will build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Only with this spirit and passion we can make the world around us a better and more peaceful place to live. And before I part, my friends, I would like to remind you of the last message which your founding father, George Washington, gave to the nation, which has tremendous relevance even today. He said, and I quote, observe good faith and justice towards all nations. Cultivate peace and harmony with all. Religion and morality enjoin this conduct. Can it be that good policy does not equally enjoin it? It will be worthy of a free, enlightened, and at no distant period, a great nation to give to mankind the magnanimous and not too novel example of a people, always guided by exalted justice and benevolence." Unquote. With this message and hope, I take your leave by thanking all of you once again. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Giovanni. I know some may need to leave for class or other purposes, but we do have a few moments for questions. Are there any questions? Please. Um, I 
sorry if I'm not very good at working with this. A lot of, uh, so, a lot of crimes against humanity, like you were speaking about, um, occur because of various differences between nations, correct? Now, due to our modern state system, right, people are confined within certain boundaries, right? If you're on this side of the line, you're Iraq, for example. If you're on this side of the line, you're Syria. Now, a lot of these crimes happen because people want, a nation wants their own identity. They want their own statehood, perhaps, or they want their own freedoms. Now, would justice to those people be punishing a person or a people group for committing a crime, or would rather the solution be more appeasing those people and um, allowing them to have their, their, their certain boundaries and their statements? Your question is that if the rule of law was to prevail, then the people who are creating these mischiefs and lawless, lawlessness would be punished or they would be persuaded. Is that the question? Yeah. Okay. You see, um, before the Second World War, Europe had witnessed worst wars in human history. Reason dawned and they created the League of Nations because they thought that if the nation states don't abide by a common set of rules, they'll continue to fight over crumbs and political issues. The League of Nations failed. Why? Because one of the superpowers refused to join it. That is the United States. And it followed a policy of isolation, isolationism in foreign policy. It was during the Second World War that humanity learned again a bitter lesson that you can't have peace without a rule-based world. And America learned a bit bitter lesson that you cannot remain isolated. And it had to use for the first time its nuclear capability. The establishment of United Nations, in which the United States played the pivotal role and provided its country for housing it, and still is the major contributor, contributor of the UN funds, because of the lessons learned in the First World War and the Second World War. That is, that as long as nation states have their way, they cannot have peace. So, whether it's Syria, whether it's Afghanistan, now, these issues have been further confounded by non-state actors. And why the non-state actors have, have, have emerged? It's again because some major countries did not comply with the UN Charter. They allowed the issues the, which had caused tension to fester and prolong. These non-state actors emerged because there was no social reformation that I have alluded to in the form of a curricula to prepare our young boys and girls for a globalized interdependence. That's why the non-state actors who have no concept of what common humanity stands for, they are creating, they are in fact merchants of death. And my belief is that they can only be controlled effectively, broadly speaking, by two mayors. One is the mayor in the short term, that is a united approach a common approach by the major powers of the world, the powers who have 
veto power in the United Nations. And the second is the long-term measure that of social, reforming them socially, that is changing their minds to make them better citizens of a world which is increasingly interdependent. Given the state of affairs, uh, and this is for just Pakistan in general, because it's been the subject of internal conflict and war and uh, just factionalism in general, uh, where do you see Pakistan being in about five to ten years? Do you think that uh, a constitutional government will be more um, more powerful in the future, or will Sharia law always be kind of a hold on the on the people of Pakistan? Oh, thank you. You see, uh, Germany today is the most stable European country. It has a stable economy and it's playing a pivotal role in sustaining and maintaining the European Union. And Merkel has won for the fourth time. It is the same Germany which saw the rise of Hitler. It's the same Germany which perpetrated Holocaust. It's the same Germany which was res responsible for the Second World War. And it was the same Germany whose top leaders were tried in the Nuremberg trial. Why I have referred to the German example is that you see the country is in historical context. And this time would pass. Don't assess countries merely by reading the headlines. See what are the trend lines in the country. The country that I come from, in the last four general elections, it has voted to power the liberal political parties. Its Supreme Court, has delivered some epoch-making judgments which will go a long way in bringing about a social change. I, I must refer to the judgment on religious freedom. And mind it, Pakistan is a country where state religion is Islam. Pakistan is a country which has witnessed worst incidents of religious intolerance. And in that country, to deliver a judgment which says Muslims and non-Muslims shall have equal right to, free, uh, right to freedom, it was a phenomenal change. Similarly, at Supreme Court, twice convicted and disqualified the prime ministers and they had to leave the office. That's another vibrant institution which is bringing about a social political change. Uh, and look at the message which is carried in the anthem of the Supreme Court. Well, uh, uh, it's not a geology, it's not self-geology when I talk about this. I just wrote it off the cuff. It was never meant to be an anthem of the Supreme Court. But the full court, 17 judges assembled mm -hmm. and requested me 
to grant permission to decorate it, decorate it as an anthem. And this best, uh, poem, this anthem carries a message that the state will, shall not discriminate whether you are a Muslim or a Christian or a Hindu. Imagine a Supreme Court having an anthem like this where the state religion is Islam. Can you imagine this? This even India would not do, which claims to be a secular state. So these are the trend lines, trend lines that you must bank your hope on when you think of Pakistan and don't see the headlines. Thank you. Hey, um, so, excuse me. Um, you talked about how American interventionalism is a good thing for the most part, um, especially in terms of the Middle East. However, uh, Iraq, for example, has proved that democracy by force doesn't really work out. And I think that the Arab Spring helped to further prove that the Middle East is just a region that's not necessarily ready for change. So how can we help the Middle East when putting boots on the ground and drone strikes isn't necessarily working? And what's the best way to enact change in the Middle East when it just doesn't seem like it's an area that's ready for change? Again, uh, when the Arab Spring was on its prime, I received an email from someone from America whom I did not know. He introduced himself and said that uh, I represent a publishing company and we would like you to write on the Arab Spring. Now it was very unusual for a judge of the Supreme Court to have received this such a request. And I wrote back, number one, I said that as a sitting judge, I cannot comment on these political issues. And secondly, I said, my take at the moment is that this Arab Spring would turn into a nightmare, Arab nightmare. Why? Because they are not ready for democracy. Neither their governments nor the major power which is closest to them has made any effort to prepare them for democracy. And the only way you can prepare them to, to demo for democracy is through education, education and by introducing liberal institutions. Unfortunately, the monarchies are being pr protected by US because of perceived self -int uh, national interest. And again, uh, I would allude to what I said when I spoke of uh, UNESCO and the, what the UN should do. There should be a uniform, uh, on certain uh, limited uniform mm -hmm. curricula which should prepare these people for universal values without which democracy can, cannot sustain. And the, the, the Arab monarchs are not too keen to prepare them for that kind of change. We want to, uh, I have one question. Please. Did I hear you say that, uh, in your opinion, India does not have a strong a principle as it relates to justice for all as exists in Pakistan? No, 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 I don't, said, I don't say that. I said even the Indian Supreme Court did not have such kind of an anthem, although it's a declared secular state. And Pakistan is not a secular state, but the anthem sends a message of liberalism, interfaith harmony, etc. I was responding to his question 
what do you see what do you see in pakistan 10 years henceforth thank you let me as we uh, close just give a example of support and it's also a tribute to justice jamani uh, there's a major dispute uh, it has to do with that uh, uh, a terrorist from, or an espionage agent from uh, India coming to Pakistan, going through a procedure, a court procedure, receiving the death penalty. And both, and India and Pakistan, both agreed to submit <coughs> this major case to an international tribunal. They recognize international law in a very sensitive case. So perhaps before we uh, question other nations, including Pakistan, we we should see that commitment to rule of law on our own part. Are we willing to commit major issues uh, to the rule of law? Uh, when they exist not internally but between major states. So I just want to say as one who's uh, been to, to Pakistan and visited in the Justice Hall that it is a wonderful country, a country of hope. And if I were to summarize the two things that Justice Jelani said, at least it touched me, and they both talk about who he is. He talked about hope, and hope can begin just in relating one to another. All those who came today evidenced hope, and evidenced the second, and that's the commitment to education. And so, we have the honor of having with us not only someone who speaks about such matters, but has lived them for the fullest. Thank you, Justice Jelani, Thank for you. your service and for who you have become. Thank you. If there are those who would like to meet the Justice, please come down. He's not unwilling if you want to have a picture taken or anything like that.